I get into the lecture uh, on the last day, I just want to express my gratitude to Ali for inviting me. It's been a real pleasure to be here with all of you to, to learn uh, from all the contributed talks and so on. Um, yeah, I mean, this has really been one of the best trips of my life, work or otherwise, and I mean that. So, uh, yeah. Um, and uh, I also think a round of applause is in order for Tuja, who has been uh, so helpful with the camera, sitting li listening to our boring math lectures. So. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, and this being the last day, now is the time to uh, bombard us with questions and, uh, yeah, any last minute concerns or whatever uh, throughout the day. But, um, so, uh, last time I talked about uh, probability and statistics for partitions, and I introduced um, the Boltzmann model here. So, uh, P of n is what I'm calling the uniform probability measure on partitions of n. Um, and the Boltzmann model is a different probability distribution on all partitions, so not just partitions of n, where you define the probability as q to the size divided by the generating function. So when you add this up over all partitions, you get one, so it's a probability measure. And uh, from yesterday, we were calling x sub k. This is the random variable that tells you the number of k's in a partition lambda. And these are independent under the Boltzmann model, um, but um, not under Pn, so only um, in the limit under P sub n, bless you. And I'll also go ahead and remind you what the um, probability density of these guys is. So Q, Q, so the probability that you have J case under the Boltzmann model is a really simple expression. It's one minus Q to the K times Q to the JK. <clears throat> and um, I'll call capital N the size. So if you add up K times oops, X sub K, so add up K times the number of times K appears, then that's the size. And um, yeah, I think that's all that I'll need. So today I'm not going to prove very many things. I'm just going to uh, throw a bunch of results at you that we can prove with the Boltzmann model. And um, yeah, hopefully you find some of these things cool. I certainly do. Um, and then I'll also talk about an algorithm for generating partitions. Um, so this all goes back to uh, Fristet's 93 paper that I mentioned yesterday. Um, so basically what he proves is kind of the following. So let S be a statistic on partitions. Um, so that means everything's determined by the X case, right? So S is determined in some way by the sequence of multiplicities. Um, and we, okay. So, in order to compare the Boltzmann model with the uniform probability measure, we get to choose our uh, real number Q in between zero and one, and the choice we make, uh, perhaps no surprise, is the saddle point. So we will choose Q naught to be the saddle point that we've seen a lot this week, e to the minus pi over root six n. <clears throat> 
then as n tends to infinity under certain conditions, which I'm not going to write, the distribution of S under the uniform probability measure agrees with uh, the distribution under uh, Q, Q naught. Okay, now I'm not going to write the certain conditions here. You can see his paper if you're interested. Um, but uh, just take it from me that it, it does apply in these examples I'm going to write up. So, um, we saw this example yesterday, but I'll go ahead and remind you. So, we could take S as the sequence X1, uh, and then we have to rescale, uh, pi over root 6n, X1, 2, X2, 3, X3, up to some k, xk. And in fact, k can depend on n. Uh, so k can be anything up to the fourth root of n. Um, then uh, Fristet's theorem applies in this case. Maybe I should say work, because it's not like a specific theorem. Um, but it applies. And um, so the probability that this sequence um, is, is, is less than something. So pi uh, root 6n j x j less than u j for, uh, for j from 1 to k. This distribution coincides with that of the Boltzmann model. So asymptotic to Q, Q naught of the same thing. Okay. And now what we do is we use independence. So I can split this into a product because uh, the xj's are independent. So I can just say product from j from 1 to k. So this is using independence. So I'm just going to write the same thing for each j, j x j less than or equal to u j. And then we just plug in to the simple definition for this guy here. So um, yeah, maybe I'll write that up here. So the uh, qq probability that this is less than or equal to j would be, um, what would that be? Um, 1 minus q to the j times k plus 1, I believe. Why is it different in my notes? Well, okay. So something like that. So, um, yeah. So we just plug in to this simple expression and we end up with the product of one minus Q naught to the, um, to the root six N over pi plus U um, over J 
times um, j u j. And all of this simplifies to 1 minus e to the minus uj. So it's just so it's just that. And this is the same distribution that we had yesterday. So And yeah, so this is the product of exponential distributions. Or, if you like, it's the distribution of k um, independent exponential distributions. Okay. Um, what do I want to keep? What about the largest part? How big is the largest part in partitions? So, so this goes back to Erdős and Lehner from 1941. They proved the following. So let C be the constant root 6 over pi. Then we have the following distribution. Um, so the probability that, okay, lambda 1 minus C root n log C root n divided by C root n is less than u is e to the minus e to the minus u. And this is what we call an extreme value distribution. Okay, and maybe that looks a little weird, so let's try and interpret what's going on here. So uh, this says, you know, if I subtract off this root log n thing, from lambda, then I get a distribution if I rescale. So the interpretation is, well, lambda one is approximately this for 100% of partitions of n. And then if you rescale that error term, if you like, to this, uh, has a distribution. So let me write the sort of interpretation. Uh, lambda 1 is approximately c root n log c root n for 100% uh, of, par of um, partitions of n. As n tends to infinity. And the difference in this approximation is uh, uh, the, the difference in this approximation on the order of root n varies like an extreme value distribution. So the error rescaled by 1 over c root n behaves like an extreme value distribution. And um, so Erdős and Lehner's proof is completely combinatorial. You can start with um, counting the number of partitions with this uh, condition, and then uh, you get some recurrence, 
and you plug in the hardy ramanujan asymptotic formula for partitions, and then this distribution comes out. So their proof is uh, via uh, recursions, so combinatorics, recurrences, and uh, the hardy ramanujan uh, asymptotic formula. But suppose we want to go further. Suppose, I guess I can keep his name. Suppose I want the distribution not just of the largest part, but of, uh, say, the largest t parts all at once. If you try and do that by recursions, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be quite complex. So um, Fristat used his method to get at that. So, um, he proved that um, if you take, let's see, here, um, sure, that'll work. So for k, so k can depend on n here as long as it's less than n to the fourth. Um, and uh, real numbers uj. So he, he found a distribution for the largest uh, t parts. And you, or excuse me, the largest k parts. So you, you do the same thing to, to lambda j there. So you subtract off this same uh, root and log n thing, rescale, less than or equal to uj for uh, j from one to k. Okay, he found some distribution for this guy. And it's a little complicated to write down. Um, so I'll do that, but. Um, the point is that you can find the distribution, whatever it is. So it's a iterated integral that looks like so of f of v1 through vk, dvk through dv1, where uh, f is the function e to the minus v1 minus etc minus vk minus e to the minus v k and zero otherwise. And it's this if uh, v1 is bigger than v2, et cetera, up to v k. OK. And uh, well, since we're talking about largest parts and partitions and you need lambda 1 to be bigger than lambda 2, bigger than lambda 3, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that's where th this condition here is, is coming from. Um, but, yeah. I missed the part. If you write minus v1 minus e to minus v1, or just v1 through vk, and the last expression depends on vk. Yeah, so this is all in the exponent. In the same way that up there we have e to the minus e to the minus u. Yeah, so it's... Just the last one. This whole thing is in the exponent. So this is e to the minus e to the minus vk. And, and this is also in the exponent. Is that? No, my question is we have minus v bar minus e to minus v bar for the first time. I think it's vk there. Uh, Only e to minus vk there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm pretty sure this is vk here because if we take k equals 1, we should get the same thing. And, well, that doesn't prove my conjecture. But anyway, uh, yeah, it coincides with that, I think, if k equals 1. Um, OK. So now I'll tell you about a fun application of this. At least I think it's fun. Oh, I can just stick this on the thing, right? 
Uh, okay, so there's a conjecture for a while by Will about uh, partitions and graphs. So the conjecture was that as n tends to infinity, 0% uh, of partitions of n are what he calls graphical. Meaning that they're vertex degrees of a simple connected graph. Uh, so lambda 1, lambda 2 are vertex degrees of a simple connected uh, graph. So for example, uh, let's just draw some random graph here. Uh, maybe like so. Uh, so one, two, three, 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 two. So then this partition would be graphical. So three uh, plus three plus three plus two plus two plus one is graphical. So that's a partition of 14, looks like. So this partition of 14 is graphical, but uh, for large n, 0% of these are gonna be graphical. And this was proved by Pittel using Fristet's distribution for the largest part. Um, so I'm not going to indicate how that's done or anything, but um, there's, there was a lot of you know, incremental progress on this, and um, I think Erdish and uh, another author whose name I'm forgetting translated this problem into certain conditions on the partition, and then Piddle showed that uh, because of this distribution on the largest part, uh, uh, this percentage here has to go to zero. Okay. Any questions so far? All right. So what about random generation of partitions? I forget about that one. <clears throat> Well, if we just um, use the Boltzmann model, at the saddle point, to choose the XKs, then we can uh, generate random partitions, right? So we just use the Boltzmann model for the uh, parameter being the saddle point um, to uh, generate um, xk's, which are, well, uh, I've erased it, but they're uh, geometric with parameter one minus q naught to the k. So all you got to do is, you know, uh, plug this into Maple, and it'll generate a random partition for you. And I claim that the partition that it generates will be a partition of size not exactly n, but close to n. So the idea is that. Um, uh, this generates 
partitions of size close to n. So not exactly equal to n necessarily, but with this parameter q0, it'll end up being close to n. And I'll describe that more precisely in a second. But I did this in Maple, and I think I was really lucky <laughs> because I got, okay, so for n uh, equals 500, I got the following. Let's see. Uh, Walter obtained 74, and I will write out the whole dang thing, so take a nap if you want. 58, 31, 24, 23, 21, 20, uh, 18, 3 13s, 3 11s, a 10, 2 9s, 4 8s. Six sevens, three sixes, four fives, one four, three threes, three twos, and fifteen ones. And guess what? That adds up to five hundred and seventeen. Which is remarkably close to five hundred. Usually when I've done this, it hasn't gotten nearly as close, so I think I got lucky. <laughs> okay. So this is super efficient. If we allow the size to be a random variable, um, then we can uh, generate partitions really quickly in this way. Did you draw a picture? A picture? Did you have to draw? No, of the Ferris diagram? No, I didn't. I thought about trying to do that, but it's too late at night. Um, but I will talk about pictures, actually, after this. Okay, so let's uh, quantify exactly how good this is. Um, and, and by that, I mean uh, how good or how close to n the partitions it generates is. Well, um, I guess I would just state the result here. Um, so the size, capital N, is actually normally distributed under the Boltzmann model. Under QQ0, picking the saddle point here um, with uh, expectation, so the mean asymptotic to n, and the variance And I forgot to check this constant yesterday, so I'm just going to write, write it like this. It's some constant times in uh, to the three halves. So your sigma squared, your standard deviation squared would be n to the three halves times a constant. Okay, so uh, the mean is n, and uh, um, we have a, a normal distribution here. So if you look at um, the probability that n minus n minus, uh, or divided by uh, some constant times n to the 3 fourths less than or equal to u, then that's, uh, you get a normal distribution. So 1 over root pi 
integral from minus infinity to u e to the minus t squared dt. So the interpretation is that um, it's going to be um, that the par partitions you generate will be close to n with an error on the order of three-fourths. End of three-fourths, excuse me. So the uh, Boltzmann model generates, so the interpretation is that the Boltzmann model generates partitions uh, lambda with size roughly n with error uh, rescaled by one of her uh, ends of the three-fourths uh, being uh, normal. With error rescaled by one of her ends of the three-fourths uh, a normal distribution. And um, I guess I should say that that's all proofed by Fristet as well. Although he didn't consider using it to generate random partitions, but he did prove this normal distribution. Any questions about anything? Okay. Um, all right, let me talk about one more cool statistic for partitions. And that is the idea of a limit shape. Okay. So the idea is we look at all partitions of N, we look at all their Ferris diagrams, and we want to uh, see what's happening um, to the shape of these diagrams. So let me just sort of draw an example. I will let lambda be a partition of n, and then I will let phi of lambda be, um, let me just say, um, the um, outer border of the Ferris diagram. Rescaled by one over root n as below. Okay, so let me just draw an example of what I mean. Um, let's take the partition 5 plus 4 plus 1 plus 1. And it's convenient when you're talking about limit shapes to draw things in the first quadrant. <laughs> Bless you. So I'm actually going to put the 5 here. Uh, 4, 1, 1. And this is a partition of 12. So I'm going to rescale the axis here by root 12, actually. So this will be 5 over root 12. And this will be uh, 4 over root 12. And so what's the area inside? Oop. Thank you. 11. 11, 11. Thank you very much. OK. so. What would be the area here? One, uno. 
Right. So I've rescaled things so that the total area is one. And the shape, this will be the shape, what I'll call the shape, will be uh, this border here. Okay. So we look at all partitions of 11 and we look at all of these curves uh, in the first quadrant. So we want to ask the question, how are these distributed? And the amazing thing is that there's only one limit shape in the following sense. So let C be the curve. I'll write it in a symmetric way and then in a non-symmetric way. So e to the minus c x plus e to the minus c y equals 1. Or if you want to solve for y, y equals minus 1 over c log 1 minus e to the minus c x for c, our favorite constant, pi over root 6. I think that's what it is. Or is it the inverse? Uh, yes, okay, good. So, uh, C, some symmetric curve like this. And I will consider for any epsilon greater than zero, an epsilon neighbor of this neighborhood of this curve. So here I have n sub epsilon of c. This is all the points that are within epsilon of c. So I have some small number epsilon. This is an epsilon uh, neighborhood of c. Then what does it mean that there's one limit shape? We have the following theorem of uh, Dimbo, Rorschach, and Zaituni. Uh, which says that for any epsilon greater than zero, the uh, probability that your your shape of the Ferris diagram is in an epsilon neighborhood of C tends to one. So the interpretation is 100% of diagrams, as in tends to infinity, are somehow uh, have their shapes like in this epsilon neighborhood. So, um, if I had a projector, I could show you a picture of evidence for this. So, if you're interested, you can, I can show you one on my laptop later. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think this is pretty surprising and pretty cool. And this is proved, actually, in a rather straightforward way, using the Boltzmann model. I won't you know, talk about the proof, but um, yeah, one can directly apply the Boltzmann model to prove this. And also, uh, here and throughout the talk, I'm lying slightly and being a little bit imprecise with all my statements for the sake of, you know, uh, education or something. Uh, okay, so some final remarks. So the key to the Boltzmann model working is the fact that we have an infinite product generating function.
So that means if we have a different infinite product generating function, like for distinct parts partitions, we can make all this work as well. Uh, so this can be adapted, for example, for uh, distinct parts partitions. So there, your generating function is this product. And in this case, if we use the same notation, xk, for the multiplicity of k in the partition, well, if I have a distinct par partition, xk can be only 0 or 1, right? You can only have 0 k's or 1 k for a distinct parts partition. So this guy, in this case, is in 0 or 1. And instead of being geometric, like he is for unrestricted partitions, it will be a Bernoulli random variable. Bless you. And lastly, I want to uh, discuss some of my work a little bit. So, I've been thinking a lot about unimodal sequences. So for partitions, um, if you have the parts of a partition, you have to order them in a you know, non-increasing way. Whereas if you have a composition, which we talked about earlier in the week, you can rearrange the order however you want. So unimodal sequences is sort of a step in between where you can go up and then down. So you have a single mode. So for example, if I look at the unimodal sequence of, of, of size four, uh, they would be this, uh, three, one, one, plus three, and four. All right, so I'm counting, for example, two plus one plus one three times as a unimodal sequence here. And they don't have a nice product generating function. And they also lack a lot of nice recurrences. So for example, uh, Khan talked about Euler's pentagonal number theorem. As far as I'm aware, there's no such thing for unimodal sequences. But someone can gladly correct me on that. So and in this case, if I say u of n is the, the number of unimodal sequences of size n, then, um, well, we can write that like this if I sum over the largest part. And using Heine's transformation, you can factor that like this. So I will leave um, this as maybe an exercise to you if you're interested in applying some of the things you've learned. So this you can get combinatorially by looking at the largest part in unimodal sequences. And uh, uh, this uh, equality you can get via Heine's transformation. Um, but anyway, 
Unimodal sequences don't fit into this Boltzmann model uh, machinery directly, but um, with Katrin Bringman, uh, we figured out a way to do that. So uh, my work uh, with, uh, well, let me just say, So we adapted Boltzmann models for this situation here. And um, And lastly, um, as part of my PhD, I showed that um, you also have a limit shape for unimodal sequences, just like you have for partitions. So unimodal sequences have uh, limit shapes. So in this case, instead of there being uh, one shape like this, you have basically a two-sided version of, of this guy. So, you know, roughly, it looks like this. I'll draw that yellow. So, you know, where I think um, there's a lot of opportunity for exploring things is with unimodal sequences. So they're a lot harder than partitions for a lot of reasons. But it turns out that we can still say a lot of really strong things. Um, so, yeah. Thank you.